please close your eyes. Think of all the decisions that you've made today. We make so many decisions every day of our lives, from what we should be wearing, to how we should be acting, to even where we should go. I suppose the very first decision you might have made this morning is to get out of bed. And the very last decision that you made, I'm hoping, is to start listening to me. But we make thousands of decisions. Even the path that you took to get you where you're standing or sitting right now is a decision and a series of decisions that you made. Now, what if you're an insect? Insects also have to make decisions in their lives. They also have to decide if, when, and how to do things. Should they fly or should they sit? Should they eat or should they wait? And where do they even go to find food? And just like us, they also take information from their external environment, such as the objects around them, the sights and the smells and the colors, and they take information from inside of them, such as if they're hungry or not, and then they make a choice. And our group studies how insects make decisions in nature. But why would anyone even care what a fly is thinking? Well, you see, insects are some of the very first animals to have ever conquered the land. They are nearly half a billion years old. And they are incredibly diverse. If you add up all of the species of insects on this planet today, it nearly equals the number of other life forms put together, including microbes and plants and even you and me. They're incredibly diverse. They have survived mass extinctions, and the fact of the matter is we could not survive without them. Now, we often think of insects as pests. They carry disease, they destroy our crops, but they're also incredibly important for our ecosystem. They perform essential ecosystem services such as pollination and also reducing waste like these termites do. And each of these behaviors, both positive and negative, are mediated by the decisions that they're making in their environment. So we're interested in studying those decisions, not only to understand them, but to also understand ourselves and how our own brains can possibly make these choices every day. But the fact of the matter is, is we don't even know how a tiny insect brain that has only about 100,000 neurons makes decisions. So how can we possibly understand our own minds when we have 80 billion neurons? So how do we start understanding insects? Maybe we should start by thinking about how we understand each other. This photograph was taken by a wonderful photographer who was actually that day taking pictures of my daughter, Grace. But that particular day, I'd had a pretty awful day at work. Everything had gone wrong. I had had so many mistakes. And I was just really feeling terrible. And so my daughter stopped. She stopped the photo shoot, and she came up to me. And she gave me what I most needed at that particular moment, which was a warm embrace. You see, Grace was practicing one of the most profound human emotions, and that's empathy. Empathy is a very powerful, but also a very difficult emotion, and it's often confused with sympathy. But whereas sympathy is when you feel bad for someone or you feel good about someone, empathy is feeling along with another human being. It is sharing such a deep connection with another person that you share their experiences as if they were your own. Now, how can you possibly empathize with an insect? I mean, you don't have wings. You can't fly. You don't have six legs. You can't imagine what it's like to be so tiny and going through the world. But you can try to understand the experiences they have in the world around them. You can try to understand the types of decisions they make and relate those decisions to the, the ones that you make as well. And we call this empathic science. To start practicing empathic science, the first thing we do is to go out to where the insects live 
in nature. And we watch them. We watch the kind of objects that they're interested in, the sights and the sounds and the tastes and the smells that they experience, and we look at the decisions they make in those environments. But this is really only part of the battle, because this is really only still sympathy. We're actually just thinking about the animals. We're not actually really experiencing their world. Since it's actually impossible to experience an insect's reality, perhaps we can share their experiences in a virtual reality. So our group is using virtual reality technology as a way to understand how insects make decisions and experience those decisions in real time as the insects are making them as a way of trying to empathize with those animals. Now the first thing you need to do in order to build a world for an insect is you need to understand their point of view. Insects have a lot of the same senses as we do. They can see, they can smell with those green antennae up there, they can taste, they can touch, and they can even detect vibrations around them. But you see, they don't experience those senses in the same way that we humans do. For example, they have compound eyes. They have hundreds to thousands of eyes, whereas we have only two. And this produces at least two main effects. First, it means that each individual eye is very tiny, and that means that they can't resolve stationary objects very clearly. They become quite blurry. However, once those objects move, or if the insect moves, then they can see very clearly and very, very quickly. As you've ever experienced, if you try to swat a fly or a mosquito, they see you coming pretty quickly. So they have excellent eyesight. But it also means that from a distance, they may have to use a different kind of sense. Humans, if you're looking for a ripe fruit, you probably see the fruit first. You maybe go and pick it up and squeeze it to see if it's ripe and maybe smell it as well. But insects likely smell their world long before they actually see it. The sense of smell for insects is very powerful and allows them to track objects from long distances and decide whether they want to go to them or not. And odors travel through the air as little packets of whatever they're smelling. When you smell something, or when an insect smells something, they're actually smelling tiny pieces of whatever it is that they're detecting, from a mango to a glass of wine. And this is a pretty disgusting thought, I imagine, if you think about some of the things you've probably already smelled today. So these particles actually evaporate from the objects and they travel through the air in little packets into the moving airstream like the wind. And they travel much like smoke does. And the insect can detect the direction of the wind and detect those little packets and then follow it to find the object, which it then sees and sits on and tastes. So now that we understand a little bit more about an insect's point of view, we then need to build the world, which means we need an architect. So enter Pavan. Pavan, can you please stand up and say hello? hello. <laughs> Pavan's a graduate student in our lab, and I gave Pavan a nearly impossible task. I told him to build a world for an insect. And that's exactly what Pavan has done. So here's Pavan's insect world. The most important part of the world, of course, is the insect. And it's here. It's the tethered fly. Tethered means it's put on a little leash. It's held in place. This doesn't hurt the fly, but it does keep it from flying away, which is important because we need to see what it's doing. So we keep it in place, much like we would be on the treadmill. We have a high-speed camera, which is able to film the behavior of the fly. And we have a panoramic display. Now, besides seeing very quickly, insects can also literally see in the back of their heads, which means the world that we build has to wrap all the way around them. Unlike humans, which when we see VR, we usually have just goggles in front of our face, and that's enough. The insects have to have their world all the way around them. We have a directional airflow, a wind, and that's important because it's needed to carry the odors that travel at high frequencies towards the antenna of the insect and give it a sense of smell and a sense of airflow. So now we put all of these different things in the world together and we allow the insect to make decisions. 
And this is what it looks like when they're making decisions. Here you can see the world that this insect is making decisions about. It's deciding about two trees. And the world looks kind of distorted. And that's because, in reality, it's wrapped in 360 degrees. And this is what it looks like if you unwrapped it. So just like a map of the world often looks distorted, so does our world if it's unwrapped. On the right side, you'll see the trajectory that the insect would be taking if it were actually flying through the world. And then you can see the fly. And its wings are very blurry because it's actually flying at this moment. And how we know the designs of decisions that it wants to make is by how it moves its wings. So much like if you're in a rowboat, if you want to go to the left, you paddle, paddle, paddle on your right. If you want to go to the right, you paddle, paddle, paddle on your left. And the fly does the same thing. It changes the amplitude of its wing beats. And by measuring those, we can tell in which direction it wants to fly. And here's what it does. So here you can see this fly making the decision to fly to this apple tree, which is a good thing because it's an apple, apple fly, so it should like apple trees. And it's going in and around the branches and the leaves of those trees. And when it's about to hit one of those branches, it actually throws up its legs because it wants to land. But of course, there's actually nothing really there to land on. And that's how we know that it's actually experiencing a virtual reality. So now, we are using this technology to try to understand how these organisms make decisions in the natural world by recreating it in a virtual world. And we try to see through their eyes and smell through their antenna how they're making decisions every day of their lives. And we feel that this is very important, not only for us to understand how any human brain could make decisions, but for a much more important reason. So often, in today's digital and urban world, we forget how connected we actually are with the nature around us. We forget how important the animals around us are for the food we eat, the water we drink, and the very land we live on. So I hope that when you leave me today, that you go outside. Go outside and find an insect and bend down and you look that little creature straight in the eyes, that beautiful little animal, and you think about all of the decisions that it made to get where it is. And then think about your own decisions, and think about how related those two are, and empathize with that animal. And then realize that those decisions together are actually dictating the very future of this planet. Because in the end, our two worlds are exactly the same. Thank you very much. <laughs>